Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight, this very chilly Wednesday night in Toronto. Hopefully wherever you are, it's warmer than where it is here. Um, just making sure you're in the right place. Today is the lab program session at the Mishter Institute. So we'll be talking about diagnostic cytology, genetics technology, and medical laboratory science. So I'll just give it a few more minutes so people can, hi everybody, so people can uh, just kind of come in here, get connected to audio. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to pop them into the chat or the Q&A and we'll do our best to either answer them with messages or answer them live at the very end of the presentation. Give it a few more minutes here. I still see people coming in. And for those who just joined, welcome to our lab program session at the Mishner Institute. Hello. All right, so I think I will get started just so we don't run out of time here. Um, so traditionally, our sessions from a few days ago, they have kind of run a little bit over. Um, so don't feel like you have to stay for the whole session. Usually it's just like kind of the ending notes, so like the Q&A and the where to contact us. So feel free to um, leave right at five or if you want to stick around, that's totally cool. We will. We are welcome to have you. OK, so today we are going to be talking about our amazing lab program. So the three listed there, Diagnostic Cytology, Genetics Technology, Medical Laboratory Science. My name is Emma. I'm the Student Recruitment Officer here at the Mr. Institute. I'll just kind of be hosting, prompting our wonderful panelists with the questions. And with that, I did want to start off by introducing our wonderful panelists. So to start off, we have our kind of interim chair of the lab programs, Fiona Cherryman. Fiona, if you want to just kind of go off, or sorry, on camera and just quickly introduce yourself. Thank you, Emma, and hello and welcome to everyone. I'm Fiona Cherryman. I'm the Head of Academic Affairs and Operations here at Michener, and I'm the interim um, chair of the three programs that we'll be reviewing today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. And then next, we have our wonderful program communication liaison. So to start off for MedLab, we have Gina. Hi, everyone. I'm Gina Pinkowski. I am faculty in the MedLab program, and I'm also the program communication liaison for the second years. Welcome. Amazing. Thank you so much, Gina. And then also for MedLab, we have Kayla. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kayla Anderson. Uh, I am the first year PCL, so I do the program communication for the first years, and I am also a faculty with MedLab. Amazing. Thanks so much, Kayla. And then next for cytology, we have Galrock. Thank you, Emma. Hi, I'm Gulru Kizilbash, and I'm the faculty and programs communication liaison for the diagnostic cytology program here at Michener. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much. And for genetics, we have Nicole, I think. Yeah, Nicole is here with us. Great. Nicole, if you want to just quickly introduce yourself. She might have just joined, so I will come back to her. So, okay, after that, we have our wonderful uh, student representatives here as well. So for to start off for MedLab, we have the wonderful Alyssa. 
Um, hi, everybody. Uh, you can call me Ali. I am currently in my second year of the medical laboratory science program. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ali. And then next for cytology, we have Jasmine. Hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine, and I'm in my second year of the diagnostic cytology program. Amazing. Thank you so much. And then finally, last but not least, we have Cindy from the genetics program. Hey, hi, everyone. I'm Cindy. Um, and I'm from the genetics program at Michener, currently in my second year and in my clinical placement. Amazing. Thank you so much. Great. And with that, that kind of wraps up all of the wonderful panelists that we'll be hearing from today. And with that, I'm going to get started with our wonderful presentation. Do, 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 do. All right. So to start off, I'm just going to be going over the agenda and the structure for today's session. So I'll start off with a bit of an introduction of Michener, what makes Michener so unique. And then I will get into our faculty panel for our first program, our student panel, and then the application process, and then a live Q&A. So for the faculty and student panel, we'll be repeating those for each of our three programs. We will then do the application process for all three programs because it is the same. It follows the same steps. And then we'll end the session with the live Q&A. And with that, I did want to do a land acknowledgement to start off because the Mr. Institute is situated in downtown Toronto. So we acknowledge the sacred land where we are today, which has been and continues to be the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River, among many other unnamed and unrecognized Indigenous communities. At this location, we stand on land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. We recognize this agreement not as a thing of the past, but as a promise today and into the future. We must share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty by taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with and transforming our personal and institutional relationships. This meeting place is still home to many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. We urge you, as future Canadian healthcare practitioners and leaders, to acknowledge that it is our collective responsibility to strengthen our ties within the communities we serve and practice healthcare in a way that advances the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's seven health related recommendations and practice your profession in that spirit. Okay, and with that, I did want to do a quick introduction to Michener and what makes our school so unique. So to start off, um, we have a very intense focus on healthcare. So we're actually the only post-secondary institution in Canada devoted exclusively to the applied health sciences. Some other schools you see might have, you know, programs in business, programs in art. We focus exclusively on applied health sciences and training health professionals. So some of our programs are actually the only ones of their kind or very, or very few programs in Canada. We also are very career driven. So our programs are very hands on, very practical. They use simulation and clinical experience to ensure that the students know exactly what it's like to work in a hospital or in the healthcare industry in general. And the percentage of Michener graduates working full time within six months of graduating is consistently over 95% on average, which is actually 10% higher than other Ontario colleges. And we're also part of the healthcare system. So not only are we part of UHN, we're also funded by the Provincial Ministry of Health. So our curriculum is therefore always informed by cutting edge research and clinical innovation. This gives our graduates kind of an edge. So we always like to say the hospitals, the healthcare industry, they know Michener, they know that our graduates are great and they will become great healthcare professionals in the future. We also have excellent quality at the Michener Institute. So we have very small class sizes. We have faculty, you'll hear from some of them today. They're all experienced healthcare professionals and almost all of our full-time programs are accredited by Accreditation Canada. And we also have heart at the center of everything that we do. So I mentioned our simulated patient scenarios. These prepare our students to connect deeply and communicate with our patients at some of the most challenging times of their lives. And our graduates are among some of the most caring and skilled leaders in their fields of practice. And with that, I did want to hop right into our first laboratory program in diagnostic cytology. So with that, I'm going to start us off with the faculty panel. So this is with our wonderful program communication liaison, Galrug, and our chair, Fiona. So with that, I did want to start us off with the first question of the night, and that is, 
who would be the ideal candidate for the cytology program? Thank you for the question, Emma. Uh, so some of the things that I can actually think of include uh, good attention to detail. A cytotechnologist screens glass slides with thousands of cells, and I feel sometimes there are just a couple of cells that show features of a cancerous change. So having that focus and attention to detail is really helpful. Someone who is more conscientious and diligent about their work, understanding the impact that our diagnosis holds for the patient population. So they should have the desire to help improve patient's health. I feel this is a profession where just being good enough is not enough, and it is important to be meticulous and do our best so that accurate information gets delivered to the clinicians and to the patients. Someone who is a self-directed learner, so someone who is self-motivated and be ready to spend the required amount of time on their learning. Since we are a hybrid program, there will be portions of the program which will be taught in an online environment. So it's important for a potential candidate to have good work ethic, ability to prioritize tasks and demonstrate good time management. Although this hybrid format, it offers a lot of flexibility, which allows students to get things done at their own time. Yet students should be mindful of the work that needs to be done. Uh, someone who's good at following protocol standards of practice, Another unique one is actually being comfortable with the element of some minor subjectivity. So just like other healthcare professions, it's not always black and white, and there could be some minor inter-observer variability when it comes to diagnosis. Um, someone who enjoys um, like maybe problem solving. So because of the overlap of features between different diagnostic conditions, it's almost like um, like solving a puzzle where you use a methodical approach and rule out different differentials before getting to the right decision. Um, also, there are certain courses which are considered to be, to be prerequisites before entering into the program and which make the foundation of what we actually build up on. If it has been a while that if you have taken anatomy and physiology courses a while back, consider refreshing your knowledge uh, before starting the program. Also comfortable using basic technology. So during online weeks, uh, we'll be delivering the education through an online platform, which is the learning management system. And we use Blackboard here at Michener. So good to have that set of skills as well. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, Fiona, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, but if not, I can hop out to the next question. Well, Galruk is always articulate, and I think she's covered really a lot of the key characteristics. Um, I think for all of the um, programs within um, the MedLab cluster, diagnostic cytologists included, um, people are often attracted to these um, professions because there is not um, direct patient care. I think that it's still very important to have strong communication skills because the ability to communicate with other healthcare providers, to work together as a team, although you're working autonomously, you're still part of a team and that teamwork and the collective work ethic is so important to um, this profession. Amazing, thank you so much to you both. Okay, and with that, I will get into the next question. And again, I see some great questions in the Q&A box. Feel free to keep those coming if you have any questions during the presentation. So our next question for the two of you is, what soft skills in general are required for a career in cytology? So just as Fiona mentioned, I would say the key one is having good communication skills, and that includes all written, verbal, as well as listening skills. Um, giving and receiving feedback, I find that's a critical area for our profession. Oftentimes, there will be diagnostic discrepancies, which could be both major and minor. Um, and you can have discussions about them, not only with colleagues, but with seniors. You can have a discussion with your supervisor, with a pathologist. So essentially, like not taking the feedback as more personal, but rather to improve the quality of work. That's also an area which we continue to work on along the course of the program. And there will be a, a lot of feedback that the student will be receiving on a regular basis. Uh, it could be both one-on-one -on -one as well as in a group setting. 
Another one is adaptability. I find it's not a static field. There have been a lot of changes, a lot of recent advances in the profession. In the scope of practice, there is modernization of processes, including more technology, artificial intelligence, so after getting employed, there could be changes happening in the departmental structure. There could be changes in your role, all depending on the type and the volume of work that the organization is getting. So flexibility and adaptability would certainly help there. Uh, critical thinking is extremely important. We practice this every day, working with patient samples, whether it be making a difficult diagnostic decision or deciding like what method to employ in preparing a sample based on the information that has been given to us. Uh, so that requires a lot of critical thinking. Working in interprofessional teams, I think Fiona touched on that. So we'll be working very closely with other medical laboratory disciplines. Uh, we'll be working with pathologists, nurses, and radiologists, uh, just to name a few. And finally, I would say strong decision making. So here at Michener, we give students the chance of making diagnostic decisions on their own in a, in a simulation setting. So that's a safe space where their diagnosis are not really like directly impacting the patient population. And this independent screening gives them the confidence and prepares them better for the workforce. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, Fiona, did you have anything else to add to that? I think that was a pretty comprehensive um, list. I mean, diagnostics is really um, has a big impact on patients. The anxiety of waiting for a diagnosis is so extreme for people. And we have great responsibility um, to provide accurate diagnoses for quite serious um, outcomes. And so that's having that empathetic um, approach is really important to the work that is done by a diagnostic cytologist. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you so much to both of you. All right, so our third question regarding diagnostic cytology is uh, where can graduates of this program typically work? Um, so in recent years, our graduates have been successful in getting employment immediately following graduation. In fact, a lot of them, they get hired at their clinical site. Typical employment sites have been um, the hospitals and community labs. But some of our graduates have uniquely used their transferable skills and they have pursued interests in veterinary clinics, helping with their diagnostics. Some have taken management positions, uh, some have taken like quality assurance roles. We have had some graduates working as technical specialists in healthcare industry. Um, others that I can think of would be like fertility centers and they're helping with doing morphological analysis. A few have taken positions in cancer research. Um, in fact, a recent graduate who got hired at the Canadian Cancer Society. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, Fiona, anything else you want to add? No, I think that the important note here is that the, um, the job market is very strong currently for diagnostic cytologists. Amazing, thank you so much. All right, and our th our fourth, sorry, and final question for the two of you today is, uh, so I know we had a couple of questions, is can you give a quick job description or what a day in the life of a cytologist would look like? I always enjoy answering this question because a historical image of a cytotechnologist is that they sit on the microscope all day. Well, that makes a huge chunk of what we do, but there has been a significant expansion in our scope of practice. So let's look at screening first, which is looking at samples under a microscope. So before turning on the microscope, a cytotechnologist would review a patient's history to see if there are any relevant areas where they should focus their attention on. Next, they will look at a slide, which is basically, which comprises of cellular specimen under the microscope. And they would attempt to dot or spot any cellular changes and make diagnosis on them, which can range anywhere from normal uh, to infections, to precancerous changes, to something significant significant as cancer. Um, in addition to screening, cytotechs are also involved in preparing cytology samples, again, using their judgment, their knowledge, and employing methods which are a good fit for the sample that they're working with. 
Cytotex have been going for EBIS, uh, which is an endobronchial ultrasound uh, in, an, in a procedure room setting. So in the recent years, EBIS procedures have actually largely increased in numbers. And during this procedure, a cytotechnologist would evaluate a patient's sample and provide information on site about sample adequacy to the radiologist while the patient is still on the procedure table or the operating table. It's almost like an operating room setup. Um, in addition to this, uh, cytotechs are preparing tissue samples and biopsies for histopathologists. Cytotechs are involved in other ancillary techniques such as immunohistochemistry, flow cytometry, um, and then like molecular discipline as well. So to answer your question, a day may look very different for every tech depending on their role in the lab. Some are screening more while others, what they call as more hybrid techs, they rotate between different departments. Amazing. I think I hope that answers the question that uh, somebody asked previously. That's great. Uh, Fiona, any last things you wanted to add before we move on? No, Golruk is obviously the um, expert to answer these types of questions. And I think there was a question maybe um, Golruk can answer with regards to um, the um, technological advances um, and the impact to diagnostic cytology. Sorry, Emma, could you please repeat the question? Oh, no, I'm just asking if, if you had any other last words before we uh, end the oh, panel. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but you've already said some great things, so <laughs> amazing. Thank you so much to both of you. That was great. Okay, and with that, we're going to move on to the cytology student discussion, um, and that is with the wonderful Jasmine. So if my slide will work, there we go. <laughs> okay, uh, Jasmine, thank you so much for being here today to represent cytology as a student. Um, so our first question for you today is, why did you choose the cytology program? Hi, yeah, so I chose the cytology program because it seemed very interesting, but also challenging at the same time. And it also combined theoretical and practical learning really well, which actually prepares you for a job in the healthcare field, which I was pretty excited about. Amazing, short and sweet, I love it, thank you. <laughs> and our second question for you is, um, can you tell us maybe about like one of your favorite courses in cytology or like a cool experience you've had in one of your courses? Yeah, for sure. So. Um, with cytology, you kind of, it's kind of split into like gynae and non-gynae. So in the first semester, you'll take gynae cytology and that's like the PAP test. So this is kind of like your main class, what you're mostly there to learn. So you start to learn about the morphology of cells in the reproductive system. And then you can differentiate between benign precancerous and cancerous lesions. And then in your second semester, you'll start to take non-gynae cytology. And this is when you start to learn about the cellular morphology of from almost all the other body sites. And then you can evaluate these cells to detect benign, atypical, and malignant changes. Amazing. Thank you so much. Those are a lot of words that I don't know, but I'm sure we'll learn if you, you do the program. So that's the point of it. All right. Awesome. And uh, our third and final question for you today, Jasmine, is uh, just in general, what's it like being a student at the Michener Institute? Yeah, well, being a student is great because there's a lot of clubs and activities that you can join. They do a lot of like, they host special nights that you can join in on. Um, the faculty is great, aka Gull. And then we also have, uh, they have so many resources to available to you if you never ever need help with anything. And then I was also um, a student on residence and that was really great as well. So overall good. <laughs> great, thank you so much, Jasmine. Amazing. And that kind of wraps up our cytology uh, panels or cytology content. Um, for all the questions that are in the chat there, we will answer them at the end during the live Q&A. If we have time, I'll just pick kind of some good questions that I see. So with that, we're going to move on to our second lab program, which is the wonderful genetics technology program. With that, I'll call on the wonderful Nicole and Fiona as well, our chair. And okay, hi Nicole. Sorry, yeah. we didn't get to introduce you before, but this is Nicole. Sorry, She's the PCL I had to go on Zoom, genetics. and all of a sudden, I had some major update, and my computer <laughs> just decided to implode, and I'm on the phone with IT. But they're wonderful. <laughs> no worries. They're of being a We have IT people here, so yeah. we got help sorted out. Perfect. Yeah. So, hi, Amazing. I'm Nicole Ratz. I'm one of the faculty in the genetics technology program. Wonderful to have you. Glad you could be here. Okay, and with that, our first question for you is, uh, can you describe the ideal candidate for the genetics technology program? So the first description I usually go for is patient focused, which is unusual because we are a lab based program and we don't have any patient contact, but all of our results drastically affect someone's life or their entire family's lives. 
um, treatments that they may get, decisions they make on their treatments. So it's definitely really important that the, pa the patient is first and foremost in a student's mind. Um, need to be very organized. We have lots and lots of different tests, lots of different papers, lots of software. So having that organization and understanding where everything is and where everything goes is really important. Attention to detail. We have a lot of very, very detailed analyses. So you need to have that focus so that you're not going to miss something um, in your analysis. Good dexterity. So even though we do a lot of computer work now with our analyses, our initial testing, our prep work is all done by us by hand in wet lab. So having that dexterity is really important. We work with very, very small tubes, very small volumes. So being able to um, handle all of that is important. Uh, being computer literate, more and more and more now, our analyses are far too complex for just one brain to handle. So we have lots of different software that we need. Some of our data, something like sequencing comes out in the terabyte zone of data. So we need uh, good knowledge on computers. You do not need to know all the software in advance. You just need to know the basics of computer work and then we will teach you the software. And uh, enjoying problem solving. Most things go very well in a lab. However, when things go wrong, it's like little puzzles that we have to solve. And it's really important that we get whatever it was that went wrong fixed so that we can get a result out for our patient and prevent that from happening again. Um, and good at following protocols. We are not a research. We're not training for a research lab. That's something you can do, but we're not training for research. So having a protocol is really, really important and being able to follow that. Also identifying when there are issues or changes need to be made and what the proper form uh, is for making those changes. That's my list. That was a very comprehensive list. Thank you so much. Uh, Fiona, anything, any notes you want to add as well? Or? No, I think um, Nicole covers everything. It's a really fast moving um, area. And so the um, commitment to always learning new and um, being adaptable to new technologies is going to be essential for genetics technologists. Mm -hmm, absolutely. All right, great. And with that, I will move us along to the second question, and that is, um, what soft skills are required for this profession? So building on exactly what Fiona just said, um, ability to adapt to change and enjoy that change. Molecular, we are constantly having new technologies, new things coming out, and they may not necessarily be adopted in every single lab, but techs need to be able to continuously keep up with their um, continuing education, knowing what's new out there, keeping in touch with all of the other clinical labs and the newer techniques, investigating whether those techniques are even possible in the current lab setting, lots of options there between resources and where you are. Is this something that would be applicable to the community that you are in or serving? So really important to be able to adapt on the fly and enjoy that. Um, teamwork is vitally important, as again, Fiona said that earlier, but not just teamwork. You're working with a huge group. We're working with the individuals in the lab, as well as senior techs, lab directors, genetic counselors, um, pathologists, physicians, lots of different options there. Teamwork is fantastic and absolutely necessary, but not necessarily every single minute of every single day. You also have to be really good at working independently without a lot of supervision, without a lot of direction. Um, because a lot of our analyses are done independently. Um, professional, both attitude and behaviors, just things, basic things like co patient confidentiality is, is absolutely critical for us. And knowing when to stop. So there are certain things that we don't do. So for instance, if you have a friend or a family member and their sample comes in, we're a very small community. There's not a lot of labs across Canada. So it would not at all be unusual for a sample to come in on someone that you know. And so understanding that that's time for you to step back and not continue working on that sample, that that would go to somebody else. Uh, ability to multitask. We are busy, but some of our tests or some of our runs take hours to do. So we're setting something up and then jumping to the next thing and jumping to another thing. So being able to multitask and do multiple things with timers going um, at the same time is really important and keeping that focus so that you're understanding what you're doing when you're jumping from one technique or test to another. 
and then good time management, not only on a day to day basis, just keeping up with what has to be done. We have quite a few time sensitive critical steps in our protocols, so you can't just forget that something is running. You have to go back to it at the right time. Um, but also understanding that our turnaround time, our patients are waiting for results. And for some of our molecular tests and cytogenetics tests, they might be waiting months for a result. It's just the, the length of time it takes to do a test and the backlogs. So understanding that if you can do it in the 10 minutes at the end of your day and get somebody a result that day, that's the choice versus, no, no, that can wait till tomorrow, right? So people are, are wanting these results and needing these results. And I think that's it for me. Amazing, thank you so much, Nicole. That was an amazing answer. Uh, Fiona, any last words for everyone? I don't think there's anything I can add to that <laughs> list. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much to both of you. All right. So our next question is, um, where can graduates of this program typically work? So multiple answers to that question. The technical answer is we train them to get a license so that they can work nationally. Um, so across Canada in a clinical genetics lab. So that's usually, and up until recently, only hospitals. We now have a few, very few, private labs as well. So that's the idea or the goal of the, the program, the main program training. However, the skills that you are taught are quite adaptable to a fair number of things. So we've had quite a few graduates who have branched out. So the biggest one being uh, forensics. So we have quite a few students who are working at the uh, RCMP forensic lab, both in Sault Ste. Marie and in Ottawa. Um, research labs, uh, obviously anywhere across Canada and any type of research almost. And then a few that are kind of more fun. Um, veterinary services now is huge. It is big, big, big money to know where your dog's genome came from. What's your breeding of your dog? It's really important in certain circles. So it's a huge area and all of that is done with molecular testing. So this, the, the techniques that we teach you are definitely applicable. That flies also into um, the food sector as well. Uh, GMOs or genetically modified organisms and food are very prevalent and common. So our techniques and our skills are also adaptable to that environment. And then working with our manufacturers of all the equipment and reagents, there's lots of options there between um, working as a sales rep, working in as a technical support, or working in developing new uh, tests. Some of the um, equipment and reagents that we use now are very, very complex. And so it's actually better, safer, cheaper for us to order kits from certain companies. So there's that uh, environment as well. Amazing. I did not know that um, dog talk breeding was a, <laughs> I did not think about that at all as a profession. That's cool. Uh, Fiona, any, any other things you want to add? No, I think um, just in the future, there are obviously career laddering opportunities through management um, and um, different sort of um, roles within hospitals, clinics and education institutions. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. And our final question is uh, if you could just briefly describe what a day in the life of this profession would look like. Well. You gotta ask the tough questions. That really depends on what lab you're in, what province you're in, what city you're in, what type of thing you're doing. Um, there are smaller labs where you are doing hands-on the entire day in wet lab, um, working on the actual setting up of tests, doing all of the analyses yourself, following samples from receipt, accessioning right through to extracting DNA, working on it, doing chromosomes, or you can be in a huge multi, um, center where you're actually working both in we have two disciplines both molecular genetics and cytogenetics so generally dna or rna work versus chromosome uh, bigger picture work so you might be doing both and going back and forth between the different labs um, there are lots of options you may just be doing microscope work you may just be doing analyses one day another day you may just be in the lab so you can go from cutting and setting up tissues one day to actually doing DNA extractions another day in a different lab. You may be staining and slide making. You so many options on what you can do from one day to another. So pretty much every day is different. There will be some repetitive and high throughput labs. You may be assigned to a specific bench or a specific test or technique where we'd be batching samples, um, but it does vary. There is 
a fair amount of analyses. So on the cytogenetic side, that is either going to be looking down a microscope or working um, with AI where they have, we have screeners now to do the microscope work. And then we're actually doing the analyses on a computer. Um, and then with molecular, there's a lot of software, as I said before, almost all of our testing now has some component of software to do analyses, but we can't always trust those results. Sometimes they come up with very unique results. And it's, so it's always on us to make sure that we check and confirm that those results are actually uh, accurate and what we want to report out. Um, and then you've got everything on the other side of it. There's all the quality control that we need to be doing. There's inventory management. There's lots of other opportunities, especially in the hospitals for things like journal clubs and um, patient rounds. We're invited to patient rounds quite frequently to present our results. Um, the big thing is we don't have any patient contact, so that's something to understand. But one of the huge advantages in our disciplines is that generally we work Monday to Friday. There is an occasional weekend, a Saturday or Sunday, maybe every month, maybe every two months or so. Generally eight hour days, Monday to Friday is the norm. So it's kind of nice not to have night shifts and weekends a lot. Sorry, for <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, great. Uh, Fiona, any final words before we wrap up? Okay, great. Thank you so much to both of you, Nicole and Fiona. That was amazing. Um, I hope everybody learned a lot. And yeah, keep the questions coming if there's anything else that you're still wondering about. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful student. Alrighty, let's get this started with Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so everyone knows the drill. We're going to ask Cindy these amazing student experience questions. The first question I had for you today was, why did you choose the genetics technology program? Right. Um, thanks, Emma. So um, when I was wrapping up um, some grad school, um, I was wondering what was the next thing for my career, what I want to do. And I was really fortunate to have um, a peer who was in another Michener program. And that's how I learned about the genetics technology program, which is really great because um, coming from grad school, I did mostly research and I wanted to move from research to something related to healthcare, related to the clinical setting. And then um, I stumbled upon um, the program. I went to like an open house just like this and um, I decided to apply. And I found that it was a really good fit for me. Um, you know, Nicole was there at the open house kind of talking about the program and it really um, resonated with me and that's why I applied. Thank you so much, Cindy. Yeah, so I hope this year's open house has as much of an impact as other students has it did on you. Amazing. Thank you so much. So our second question for you today is, um, can you tell us about like one of your favorite courses or something cool you did in one of your courses? Yeah, of course. So um, there's two branches in um, genetic technology. So Nicole spoke about um, molecular and there's also cytogenetics, which looks at more chromosome analysis. And with molecular, um, some of the, the courses that um, that's taught in the program really teach you the theory and a lot of the tests that explore, you know, properties of DNA, um, how we can manipulate them to do testing um, in the hospitals setting. And um, that's kind of you learn about um, molecular one and cytogenetics one in the fall term. And then in the winter term, you continue that with molec two and cytogenetics two. So most of the fall and winter are theory. And then it's um, labs that you go to the missioner so that you can do the test and then analyze the data that you get. So my favorite course was um, in, I think the winter term cytogenetics, because we're looking more at um, like fish analysis, which kind of looks at um, fluorescent probes that bind the DNA um, or the chromosomes, and then you kind of visualize it under the microscope under, you know, uh, certain floor floors. So I always love seeing those images um, and analyzing them because it's a new technique that I really didn't get to learn um, in undergrad or any other courses that I took either um, at the Michener or, or not the Michener, but when I was um, in a different institution. So that's, that's kind of cool. I really liked um, learning things, the theory behind it, and then applying it in the labs as well. That sounds really cool. Thank you so much, Cindy. All right, so our final question for you today, it, oh, won't let me switch, there we go. Um, what's it like in general just being a student at Michener? So I really liked um, that 
the classes are really small. It really helps me as a learner because I get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the faculty. Um, for example, for our labs, because it was a hybrid program, sometimes there was four students um, doing the lab, sometimes there were eight. And so faculty really um, gave us a lot of their attention. So if I had a question, it was really nice to ask them and have that one-on-one -on -one interaction that you know sometimes we don't have in larger classes. That's one thing I really liked. Um, also at the Michener, there's a lot of resources like the LRC, if you wanna go to a quiet place study, um, Commissioner has that. There's also like the student network, SSN, um, and they always have really cool activities like around, I think Halloween time, they always have treats and whatnot. So it's really nice that there's a community at the Michener, but also um, like the learning style for the program. And um, lastly, I'd say it's just also the, the people that are in the program. Like some of my closest friends are people that I've met in my class. And um, they're just people that, are like-minded they really have a passion for science and genetics and it's really nice to be around um, those types of people that sounds great thank you so much cindy all right and that wraps up our genetics technology content thank you so much to all the panelists for giving your incredible insights on the program and on the profession in general so with that we're going to go into our final lab program and that is the medical laboratory science program so with that, I'm going to call on the wonderful Gina and Kayla, as well as Fiona, of course, to answer our faculty panel questions. So let's wait, make sure that they're all ready here. So the first question that we have for all of you is, uh, can you describe the ideal candidate for this program? Hi, it's Gina. So um, I just wanted to say, first of all, that everyone has basically, we're, they're all lab programs. So everyone has, has basically said everything that I'm going to be saying. But um, I, I think one of the most important things is that most people who gravitate to the med lab uh, technology program are really care about patients and want to have an impact on patient outco health outcomes. Um, but they don't want to have any direct patient contact. So it's really important that people know that if you are working in med lab, other than taking someone's uh, blood occasionally, you're, you don't have any contact with the patient. But you do need to be comfortable working with um, patients' blood, body fluids, and other tissues. And you also have to be comfortable using a variety of really complex automated lab instruments to do your testing. So not all our testing is done using instruments. However, it is a huge part of doing your lab um, work. Uh, you have to have good uh, manual dexterity because some of our lab testing techniques do require the use of really fine motor skills. But most importantly, the person should have an inquiring mind because they'll be helping to diagnose disease by investigating um, patient samples. Thank you so much, Gina. Uh, Kayla or Fiona, anything else you wanted to add to that question? No, I think Gina covered it all. Thank you, Emma. Awesome. Great. All right. So our next question for the three of you is uh, what soft skills in general are required for this profession? So as I, as everyone has been saying, um, one of the most important skills you need for this profession is to have excellent communication and listening skills. So some examples of where you would uh, use these are when you're collecting uh, information before you take a patient's blood for testing, if you're communicating results or clarifying tests with other medical personnel or sharing information with your coworkers. You also need to be able to understand written information and follow directions since you'll be using um, uh, lab standard operating procedures to perform all your tests. You have to be really detail oriented and have good critical thinking skills because these really contribute to the accuracy of your lab results. You have to be a good problem solver um, since you need to recognize and re be able to resolve errors or test results that don't make sense. And of course, you have to be very organized, be a good multitasker, be able to prioritize. And as everyone else said, to be able to work both independently as part and as part of a team. Thank you so much, Gina. Uh, anybody else wanted to add anything before we go on to the next question? No? I think we're good, Emma. Thanks. Okay, great. All right, so our third question for today is, uh, where can graduates of this program typically work? 
Hi, it's Kayla. I'm going to take over the last two questions here. Um, so with MedLab, once you've successfully completed our program, uh, we do have a licensing exam that usually occurs within a few weeks um, after that. And as soon as you get licensed, you generally work as a MedLab technologist in a few different areas. Um, a hospital uh, lab is, is quite common, a private lab or public health labs. Um, so I, I believe Fiona mentioned earlier in this presentation, there are um, quite a few job openings at the moment. There is a shortage of our career. So it's actually co quite common nowadays to get job offers even before getting your license. So um, the work is definitely out there. Uh, within our discipline, there's actually five different types of labs that you can end up working in. Those are chemistry, transfusion science, histology, hematology, and microbiology, the one I work in actually. Uh, and there's other types of smaller labs that you may, um, that occasionally some people do work in, like forensics, uh, veterinary testing, pharmaceuticals, and environmental testing. But the vast majority of what we get into are the diagnostic labs. So the five disciplines that I mentioned there. Um, so after a few years of general bench experience, uh, again, other people kind of mentioned this earlier, but you can kind of move up into like a more senior role or maybe a supervisor or a manager. And there's additional career paths that people have gone into over the years. Um, if you're looking to maybe branch out and try something new. So there's things like quality assurance, um, roles in education, like what we are currently doing. Uh, IT based roles where you do like um, the laboratory information system. Uh, infection control practitioners uh, have been quite common nowadays, uh, especially with the pandemic. So a lot of med lab technologists have increased their education and are working in infection control in congregate care settings. Uh, what else do I have? Oh, pathologist assistants. Um, so that's kind of along the lines of our histotechnology program uh, where you process larger tissues and you can assist or perform autopsies. Uh, you can be an auditor for our regulatory bodies and amongst other career paths. So even though you may enter in med lab, there's plenty of areas that you can go into. Thank you so much, Kayla. That was a great answer. All right. Anything else anyone want to add? Maybe I would just add that the real benefit, I think, of um, MLT um, is that it has great breadth. And so if you're looking to work um, almost anywhere in Canada, there will be um, a place for an MLT to work. Um, genetics and diagnostic cytology are more specialized. So the breadth and depth of a um, med lab um, education are something for you to consider consider based upon where you may wish to work in the future. Excellent point, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and with that, I will move on to our final question for the night for the faculty, and that is, can you describe a day in the life of this profession? Yes, and it's along the same lines as genetics. So this does actually very much depend on which of the disciplines you end up working in, how large the facility is that you're working in, um, so wherever it may be, in a hospital, a private lab, a government lab, um, there is generally more shifts associated with med lab technologists. So they could be day shifts, afternoon shifts, evenings and overnight shifts on weekends and holidays. So you do have to take that into consideration when you're going into med lab. It is healthcare. So we do have to be there. And then some of the tests that we do are extremely stat and really make an important um, it's, they're really integral to the, the care of the patient. Um, so some of the disciplines are more prone to shifts than others. For example, if you're working in a transfusion medicine lab, these ones will be 24 hour labs because it's very important that you get blood to someone that is bleeding and needs it immediately. Uh, whereas maybe a histotechnology lab where you're doing um, tissue specimens, not all of these specimen types are incredibly stat. So you're more likely to do more like Monday to Friday day shifts on those. So there is a little bit of flexibility and still when you get into the program, you just need to be aware when you're applying for jobs. Um, so as far as a, like a routine day, I'm just going to be very general because obviously it will vary depending on which site you're at or which discipline you're doing, but it generally includes um, morning maintenance of your analyzers or the tests that you're doing, quality control of your tests, um, an inventory of the work that needs to be done uh, during that day, 
There might be a huddle with your team or even just like a little meeting with the person that you are covering uh, as they are finishing their shift. And then the majority of the work that you're gonna do throughout the day involves interpretation and analysis of test results. So there's many examples of this. You could be working with analyzers. You could be doing tests on bacteria that were growing in culture. You could be processing tissues and cutting and staining them. Uh, there's a lot of microscope work as well. So you might be working on a mic all day and there's many other types of specialized tests. So there is quite the variety for anybody that loves lab work. Um, throughout the shift, it's really important that you are aware of speci uh, specimen prioritization and communicating these stat results to the clinicians. So you can have lots of discussions with nurses, physicians, amongst anyone else in their care team. So just make sure you have those communications as well because there is a lot of communicating of these results. And then um, as mentioned before, there's extensive training and there's standard protocols. Um, so by the time you're working independently, you'll be very familiar with the procedures of your site. Um, and although most of the work that we do is independent, you will be surrounded by other technologists. So there's a lot of um, discussions. You can refer to people if you're ever unsure and you can ask for assistance. Um, so ultimately, you will be a part of a team. Um, so again, if your specimen load is light for that day, or if um, you have a really high specimen load, it's really uh, important that you can work well within that team and you can assist others and they can assist you. So again, independent work, but a, a lot of teamwork skills are involved. And I believe that's it. Thank you so much, Kayla. Anyone else wanted to add anything before we wrap up? No? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much to all of you. That was amazing. Um, and with that, we're going to pass it over to our final student panelist of the night, the wonderful Allie, to answer some of her uh, student experience questions uh, during her time at Michener. So our first question today, Allie, is uh, why did you choose the med lab program? Um, yes, I love answering this question for people. So why did I choose med lab? I so I did my undergrad at Western and I did a lot of theory based uh, courses and I feel like I was learning a lot of information, but I wasn't really sure how I was going to apply that to the workforce or to a career later on. Um, while I was at Western, I did an internship where I was able to work in two different industry labs um, and it was really cool getting that lab work experience. Um, and that's when I realized that like I really do just love working in a lab, all the hands on testing that we do. Um, and I've always really been interested in healthcare. That's why I did like a medical science program at Western. Um, so I, I've always been interested in helping other people and um, especially in the, one of their hardest times in their life when they come into a hospital and stuff like that. Um, so that's why I chose medical laboratory science, because it kind of combines healthcare and just I love doing the lab work. So it's a perfect combination of the two. Well, great answer. Thank you so much. All right. And our second question for you today is, uh, can you tell us about one of your favorite courses or a cool experience you had in a course? Yeah. So all of the courses are, I think, really well designed to really just prepare us for the workforce. Um, we do, as Kayla mentioned, there's five different disciplines within medical laboratory science. So we do have courses in all of those five disciplines. Um, and in each of those courses, we learn um, the theory of the conditions that we would encounter, um, all about the instrumentation that we would be using to um, test the patient specimens, um, different tests that we would use to diagnose the conditions. Um, and we do learn about like limitations for all these tests and how to troubleshoot any abnormalities, anything that might go wrong. Um, it is very job task focused in these kind of courses. Um, and I do feel like I like really am learning what I need to be able to succeed as an MLT later on. Um, and then we also have some interdisciplinary courses. Um, I've, everybody's been saying that it's really important to have communication skills and teamwork skills and all that stuff, which we actually have a whole course dedicated to communication and teamwork and how to do all that, which was really interesting that we got to do that interdisciplinary course because it involved not only the med lab program, but also the genetics and the diagnostic cytology program. It brought us all together so we can kind of like share our different experiences and see how all of our fields work together. Um, I will say it is a really 
definitely a full-time course load. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's really helpful to learn everything and it really prepares us for what we're gonna need to do. And all of the professors have been exceptionally helpful in um, helping us get all of our work done and really succeed in the courses. That's great. Thank you so much, Ali. All right, and our last question for you tonight is, in general, what is it like being a student at Michener? Um, I love being a student at Michener. It is um, a really small school, so you really get to know everybody around you, especially in your program. Um, we're separated into our lab groups because MedLab is one of the bigger programs at Michener. Um, so we're separated into smaller lab groups, and I've honestly gotten so close with everybody in my lab group that it just feels like we're hanging out as we're like friends and our during our lunchtime. It's it's a really great environment. We're all very supportive of each other. Um, it's not like I know some people have experience from university where it's like really competitive, like everybody wants to be the top, but it doesn't feel like that at all at Michener. We're all just kind of here supporting each other so that we can all become MLTs one day. Um, it's also really cool that it's such a small school that you really get to know not only the students, but the staff and the faculty. Um, and it's great that like I feel like I can stop and say hi and chat to people in the hallways. And that's really cool to have that around. Um, there's also a lot of supports available for students at Michener, um, SSN and the LRC, um, lots of like faculty support. Um, I've also been a part of the student council at Michener for the last two years. Um, and I think that that's been a really great environment to meet different people. We put on a whole bunch of events throughout the year to support students in their academic needs and also put on like some social events so you can meet other people from other programs and everybody's uh, in the healthcare field. So we all have so much in common that it's really cool to just talk to everybody and hear about what they're doing in their programs as well. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Allie. And Allie's actually, she helps us at the front desk at the uh, registrar's office as well. So we love having her around as well. All right. Thank you so much. All right. And with that, that is kind of the end of our panel discussions. I am going to go through the application process for our lab programs because uh, they do follow the same application process in general. So it consists of five steps. First of all, obviously, make sure you review the admission requirements. You can find the full admission requirements on our website for each of these programs. Just review them, make sure that you meet them or are going to meet them for the application cycle you're applying to. Secondly, prepare your supporting documents, whether that be transcripts, the applicant experience checklist. Make sure you have all those things ready. You know how to access them for that deadline. And then third, you want to apply via the Ontario College application system. That deadline is February the 1st of 2023. There is an application and supplemental fee. The total for those two comes to $165. And then number four, register and complete your CASPER assessment. The CASPER is an online computer-based test. It tests things like your ethical judgment, your verbal and written response to certain things. And unfortunately, it is a test you cannot really study for, but there are a lot of guides and practices online that you can take. So you would register for that at Take Altus using the nine-digit OCAS application number you receive on OCAS when you apply. And then number five is to submit your supporting documents to OCAS, and that deadline is February the 8th of 2023. And that kind of wraps up the full application process for any of these three programs. So now we're going to get into the uh, live Q&A. So I do have a bunch of questions. I'm just going to pick a few um, that I feel like might be interesting to answer. Um, I saw a few people asking about clinicals. Um, so can maybe one of the uh, the the faculty can you maybe answer where are the clinicals like are they situated in Ontario in Canada would they be close to where the student lives how does that process kind of work okay <laughs> I'll jump in a little bit so we're all different every program has clinicals in sort of different areas genetics has quite a few clinical placement sites across Ontario but we're not just in Ontario either we have sites in uh, Calgary Newfoundland Oh my goodness, they're all over the place. Um, and even from this area, it's not just GTA. We have London and Kingston and Ottawa, um, Hamilton, Mississauga, that sort of thing as well. So they're all across uh, Canada. There is some decision uh, or choices in it, um, but it can come down to a lottery. So when you join the program, you're agreeing to go to any one of the sites. Thank you so much, Nicole. 
Um, and I guess uh, another question that somebody has here, um, I don't know if anyone wants to kind of, can you switch? So if somebody wanted, was like starting in cytology, can they switch into the med lab program or could they go from med lab to cytology? Does anyone know if, if that's possible or advised even? <laughs> I can probably take that question. Um, I think that the programs are too distinct in the early days for you to transfer easily. And so that's not really possible um, at this point. Thank you so much, Fiona. All right, so let me see. Here. Sorry, Emma, I'm going to interject one oh, thing. Yeah, having, sure. having said that, though, one of the um, entrances or pathways into genetics is for a full MLT. So someone who's taken the MLT program, graduated, has their license, they are eligible to come into genetics after that as well. So we have quite a few MLT students, graduated MLT students that come into genetics next. Amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, this is another question about med labs. Maybe Gina or Kayla can answer this. Uh, what is the work-life balance like for a medical lab technologist? Gina, I can probably take this since I sure. really work in the hospital <laughs> as well as being amateur. Um, it's, it's actually comparatively very good. A lot of what we do, we leave at work. So it is continual shift work for the most part. So someone else will finish whatever you don't. So it is very good work-life balance. If you're looking for holidays off, this may not be the right career. Healthcare may not be the right career for you, but uh, the work-life balance, I believe, is, is pretty good comparatively. Thank you so much, Kayla. All right, and I see, let me see here. I see a lot of questions about Casper. I know that it's kind of a new thing for a lot of people. They, they're probably a little bit worried about it. So in general, Casper, you can take it once per admission cycle. Um, some people find it challenging. Some people find it easy. My advice to you would be to make sure you're familiar with the structure of the test and make sure that you, you know, find guides, find practices online. But in general, it's kind of your, it's a test to your like on the fly responses to things. So um, it's not really something that you can study for, unfortunately. So, yeah. So I think that is all the questions I will do for now because we are at time. So I just wanted to briefly go over some of the ways you can contact us after this session. So we have something called Ask Me that just launched. So it is every Wednesday from 1 to 2 p.m. weekly from November 2nd to February 9th of 2023. So that is with our lovely admissions team. We spent spending an hour on Zoom. You can ask them any kinds of questions about the application process, admissions, all that good stuff. They will be there every Wednesday until February 9th. And then we also do have two admission webinars coming up next week. So next week, Wednesday, we're holding our full-time program webinar again with the admissions team. That's from four to five. And the day after, the Thursday, we're holding another webinar for the part-time programs. That is also from four to five. And of course, if you have any questions in between those sessions, if you just have like a very personal admissions question, you have a unique case, feel free to email us at admissions at michener.ca. Our admissions team is monitoring that inbox as well. They would be happy to answer any questions you have about the application, admission requirements, programs, all that great stuff. And with that, I will wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for giving your wonderful insights. This recording of this session will be posted probably sometime tomorrow on our events page. So if you missed anything or if you want to watch it again, feel free to check back uh, late tomorrow and it should be posted there. And with that, have a wonderful night. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming and have a wonderful rest of your day. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.